everyone. I think we're good to start. My name is Feline Hermans. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And my, uh, I'm on Twitter as well. So if you want to mention me, if you say something nice, this is my handle. And also my slides are already on my website. So if you want to check them out later, this is the URL where they are. My talk is about program derivation. So this is, for me at least, how normal programming goes. You have a problem, and then you get really like super frustrated, and you think so deep that smoke comes out of your head, and then, ta-da, you have an idea, and then you're happy. That, that's when programming is nice, and then you have your program. That is normal programming. Program derivation, on the other hand, is where you start with a problem, but before you start programming, you write a specification. And look, you're still happy because writing a specification is pretty nice. And then you take your specification and you derive a program from it. Notice how you're still happy because program derivation is also very fun. And in the end, you have a program and you're still happy. So no frustration, no deep thinking. You just use your mathematical skills to go from a problem to a program. And the added benefit is because you derive your program, it's guaranteed to be correct. So you don't need testing, you don't need verification after the fact, because you've derived your program from the specification, it will be correct, and that's a nice added bonus. So let's start with something super simple. We want to sum a number of values from 0 to n minus 1 to give us a secret, a, super, a secret super value that we're calculating. So remember the steps I talked about in the beginning of my talk. The first thing we need after we have a problem is write a specification. So this, again, is our uh, value. And you can write this down from 0 to n minus 1, a little bit shorter, like this. So it's just nothing special here. The sum of all values i between 0 and n. And what you're going to sum is the value i. So what I have, and this is something super cool, no one, no one has this, is I have a version of ReSharper that works on my handwriting. Look at this. I'm going to take that value n, and I'm going to refactor it and introduce a parameter, and it, it actually works. Look at that. ReSharper says, oh, I'm fine. Do you want to introduce a parameter here? What, what should it be named? So I say, OK, let, let's, let's call it n. No problem, there you go. So this is what ReSharper normally does. If you have a constant value, you can introduce a parameter and then just replace your constant by a parameter of your function. This is a technique you already know, you're already familiar with if you use ReSharper. So introduce parameter is actually secretly a program derivation technique called generalization. You go from a constant to a variable in your program, so nothing to be scared about. One thing, though, is instead of using brackets, I know they are like hugs, that's, that's totally fine, but I, I'm really bad at drawing parentheses. I, I never get them right, and you know they don't, they're not the same. They don't look nice, so instead of using brackets, I will use a dot for function application because I'm too lazy to mess with my slides for a very long time. I hope that's not too confusing to anyone. So what's next? We have a problem. We have a specification. So the next thing we're going to do is we'll use some math, some super math program derivation on our value. Let's start simple. We're just going to do case analysis for the value n is 0. So if n is 0, we can say, well, what is the secret super value of n, uh, sorry, of 0? We take the definition. The definition is right there. OK, so that's just the sum of i for all i's from 0 to 0. And what we're going to sum is i. So this is simply taking the definition, substituting the, the n with a 0, and then you get this. <coughs> But what's interesting in this situation is there is no such i. I cannot come up with an i that's both smaller and equal than 0 and bigger than 0. There's no i that can fit in that range. So that means we have a summation over an empty range, which is 0. So this is still pretty easy. If we're summing 0 values, we get 0. So that was the case n is 0. The next case, obviously, would be n is 1. And we could do the same thing. We're going to calculate the secret super value of 1. However, 
That's, of course, not very efficient. If we start with zero, and then one, and then two, you know, and I haven't told you what my big N is, so that could go on until the ice cream party tonight. So what we observe here is there's something special about the natural numbers. If we start with zero, and if we just have a plus one operation, we can reach all the numbers there are that we need for this super value. So here's a turtle. He starts at zero. He can reach it. Look, he's right there, so we're pretty sure he can reach the zero. And now what the turtle can also do is he can make a little hop to the next value. There he goes. Huh. And he can move one forward. Just with those two operations, the turtle can reach any number. There he goes, vroom, to the five. And the interesting technique, the, the interesting about the thing about this technique is that because he only can do the plus one operation, if we're at, let's say, five, I can assume that I once was at four. This is because the only operation I have is starting at zero and doing the little hop. There's no spaceship that can drop me here at the five. And that idea is called the induction hypothesis. So I know that if I'm at a higher value, I can assume that everything that happened before that is already taken care of, because that's, that's how turtles roll. <coughs> so instead of making the case for n is one and two and three and four, we're just going to say we covered the basics, zero is already covered, and now we're going to look at the, st the step one. So we do n is n plus 1. Again, here we just take the definition of n, and uh, sorry, the definition of the secret supervalue, and here we get this just with the replication. Uh, we take n and we put n plus 1 there, and we now assume that for n, because n is smaller than n plus 1, our ground is already covered. So now observe this here i is smaller than n plus 1. That means that i can be at most n, that's the highest it can be, because it's smaller than n plus 1. So either it's smaller than n, or it is n. Those are the two options we have. And this is sort of one of those tricks you have to know. If you see a range, you can split it. That's how this is called. So here we have the same situation as with the n. We have a domain, now in this case it's not empty, but it's one value, but you see how that goes if I'm only summing one value. It's sort of easy to see that that is that exact value. And then what do we see right there? Hello, what is that? We know that guy, that is the induction hypothesis, because we're now in a situation where we have n, which is smaller than n plus 1, we may assume that that is already taken care of. So that, with the induction hypothesis, is the secret supervalue of n plus n. Ta-da! Houston, we have a program! You see how there was no real thinking involved? I wasn't like, a for loop. What should go in it? It was just step by step, I have derived a program. So if I want to really calculate my secret super value, if n is zero, I'm just giving zero, and otherwise I'll do a recursive call to the value one below me plus the value one below me. Anyone see anything strange about this program? I have a bet that's going to tell you what's strange about this. You see how I secretly stole a one here? Because if we go back to my derivation, I'm deriving n plus one is n, super value n plus n, and here I'm putting it with, calling with n, and that's just because most programming languages don't really like if you define a function with a variable in the signature. So I just secretly did a tech, used a technique here that's called dummy transformation, but I guess you can see how if it goes from n plus 1 to n, it would also go from n to n minus 1. So I'm just hoping you trust that I don't, didn't do anything uh, secretly mean there. Okay, so at this point in my talk, maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, but I could come up with that program. That is a very easy program. I don't need program derivation to calculate the sum of a bunch of numbers. Yeah, that's true, but yeah, you know, you have to start easy. But what you maybe want is something new. Derive an algorithm that you haven't seen before, or at least for which you couldn't come up with the derivation yourself. So the rest of my talk, I'm going to spend on this 
two sorting algorithms for the price of one. I will start with defining what exactly sorting is, and then I will derive two different but similar sorting algorithms from a specification. So let me first define this function. This function is called all elements, all element, and it's a function that goes from a list to a bag. And a bag is like a list, but in a bag, I do not do any assumptions on the order of the elements. So it's really like a list. The only thing is I cannot point at an element and say that element comes before that element. There is no ordering. So it's kind of easy to define a definition for all elements. If I have the empty list, all elements is the empty bag. If I have a list of one item, the all elements is exactly that the item, and if I have, want to have all elements of a longer list, as this means concatenation, as concatenated with T, that is just all the elements in one sublist, all the elements in the other sublist, and then this plus means a union of two bags. So you just take all the elements, you throw them together in a bag, and you're not caring about the order. So the second function we need to define our sorting function is the is ascending function. This is a function that goes from a list to a Boolean, and I guess you already feel where this is going. This function expresses whether or not the list is ascending. Here's a formal definition. So a list is ascending if for any pair i, j in the list, if i is smaller than j, that means the element at i is smaller than or equal to j. But if this is too much for you, it goes a bit quick and there are a lot unfamiliar symbols, don't worry about it, this just means the elements are in order. <coughs> so with these two functions, we can formally specify how a sorting function works. Because the function sort says that for any, for any um, bag I take, if I sort the bag that has the same elements as were originally in the bag, and also if I sort the bag, then that list that results should be ascending. And this basically means no one is stealing any items, and at the end, they are all in order. So that's two, the two parts of the definition. Because without this, it would be very easy to sort the list. You could just remove all elements, and then you could say, ta-da, my list is sorted. And that, that would be slightly cheating. So that's why this is important. You have to make sure that all of the elements are there. And that's also the part of the specification that we're going to focus on most in the rest of this presentation. <coughs> so here's our specification. Remind, a reminder, we're not going to do any thinking. So if you're thinking about how will the algorithm look like, stop doing that. Don't, don't think what will happen. Just follow the steps. And this is actually quite hard. If you're doing program derivation, especially if, you're, if you have some experience in programming already, it's really very hard to not think step by step because you'll think, oh, I, kn I know where this is going. And then sometimes you're not entirely correct. So as I said, we're just going to focus for this talk mainly on the first half of the spe specification that says we can't steal al any elements because yeah, they only give me 30 minutes and I could spend all day on this, really. So we'll just consider the first half of this specification. And again, we're going to use induction. So I showed induction before when we're going from 0 to 5. But now we're not talking about natural numbers here. We're talking about bags. So we have a similar idea for induction. We say our little turtle friend can start at the empty bag and then can reach any bag. The, the hop now, instead of is adding one, is adding two bags together. So one element at a time, or also it could be two bigger sublists. So th the idea is the same. We have a base case and we have hopes to create a bigger situation from a base case. So we start first with the empty bag, like we started with zero. <coughs> and this flag, by the way, I didn't, don't think I mentioned that before, is sort of like a scope. So I'm just saying within this flag, that is what holds. So within the scope of this flag, B is equal to the empty bag. So this needs to hold for any B, so also for the empty bag. I can just substitute it. So all the elements of sorting the empty bag should be equal to the empty bag. Now at this point, I don't really know what to do. 
there's nothing that I can calculate with. I don't see any ladybugs popping up with an induction hypothesis. So the only thing I can do is go back to the specification go back to the specification of the all elements, for example. And what I observe there is, hey, look at that. There's an empty bag right there. That is something I can use. <coughs> I have an empty bag here, and I have an equality for the empty bag. So what I can do, these two things are equal, is I could substitute the one for the other. And of course, we are now on a happy path in this presentation where everything works out, but th this is something where you can use, if you have a number of equalities, you can use su try substituting the one for the other and just see where it's going. So we're going to do that. So this is just using that equality, and it feels like we might be going somewhere because we have a situation where we have the same function on two sides of the equality sign. And to make this true, if I want all elements of the empty bag to be equal to all elements of the empty list, if it would be the case that this would were true, suppose sorting an empty bag would result in an empty list, then my problems would be solved because if this is true, this automatically follows. And that's may maybe a little bit tricky, so I have a small intermezzo here that explains what exactly is happening. So I have a function on x and a function on y, and I must make this true. So what I can do is I can just say, well, if only x and y would be equal, then applying a function to those x and y, would, the, the results must also be equal. If x and y are equal, then the f of x is equal to the f of y for any f you can think of. Ex except maybe if you have really, st if you think implementation-wise, of course, you can think of a function that will return the current date or the current time. Yeah, if you put in something, you will get a different result every minute. However, if you talk about pure mathematical functions, then if you put in the same element, also the same element will come out. For example, here's a simple example. 1 plus 3 is 4, and 2 plus 2 is also 4. So if I'm going to square them, the result will be the same. The reverse, however, is not always true. So that means that if it were only the case that sorting an empty bag would be equal to the, the empty list, then my problems would be solved because then I have made the equation true for the empty bag. And in a similar way that I'm not going to explain, but I, under I think you can understand it, an a bag of one element results in just a list of that one element. That's the second base case we need. So that was sort of the simple story, the first hop, the zero. Now we're going to hop one more. So now we say our bag is equal to two sub-bags, S and T. That's the hope we need. <coughs> this is what we need to make true. All of the elements of the sorting of S plus T should be equal to S plus T. We're not stealing. This is our induction hypothesis. For any B, it holds that all elements of B, uh, all elements of the sorting of B is equal to B, as long as that B is smaller than the item we're talking about right now. I can assume that everything that happened before me is already true. So if that B would be strictly smaller than S plus T, my problem would be solved. Well, look at that. That S there is smaller than S plus T. As long as T is not the empty bag, then S is strictly smaller then S plus T, so I can use the induction hypothesis. Here it is again. So here I can replace that S by the all elements of S as long as T is not the empty bag. And I can do the same on T, and now I'm in this situation. It sort of looks a little bit like the thing we did in the base case. Now, here is the part that, that might confuse you. So if you're tweeting, stop and pay attention, because seriously, if you lose this step, then everything else of the presentation will be lost. So it's, it's kind of important that you're here with me. So I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to solve this situation. I don't have any equation anymore that I can apply. So here's the, the smart trick that I'm going to do. I'm just going to say, I will invent a function that will solve my problem. I'm inventing the puzzle, and with that puzzle, the problem is solved. So now, yeah, I have a sorting algorithm. Look at that. This is the sorting of a bag for, to a list. If my input is the empty bag, I return the empty list. If my input is uh, an 
bag of one element, I return a list of one element. And otherwise, I'm just going to sort the one side, sort the other side, and puzzle them together. <laughs> Ta-da! Everyone is happy. Apart from my bunny, he's not really happy. He's very confused. He's like, wait a minute, b b b what is that puzzle? I'm confused, help. So the next thing we need to do now, now we've sort of solved our problem, is we need to invent a puzzle that exactly solves our problem. So the puzzle must follow this, because this is the, the step where I made you pay attention. Th this is where I did the substitution with the puzzle. So this, this, this has to be true, otherwise the whole rest of my proof is falling flat. And also, a short reminder, in the beginning I said we're only focusing on that half, but I, can, I guess you can see that if we would do a similar exercise for the second half, then that would result in this specification for the puzzle. So if I have a, a sub-half that's already ascending and the other one is ascending too, I have to puzzle them together and then that's ascending. Otherwise, I couldn't use my induction hypothesis. So this, there is an extra proof, but that didn't fit into the margin of this talk as well. So does anyone have an idea what the puzzle might be? A function that you already know about, maybe that you use on a regular basis. I know there are Haskell people in the audience. <laughs> this is a function you use. Any guesses? Union? Uh, it, it's a reminder, it's on lists. So what is a, what is a union for lists? Okay. <laughs> yeah, very good. Co list concatenation. So this is just a guess. So again, this is not a situation, I'm, I'm showing you the happy path now. You could have lots of ideas for what that puzzle could be, and this is, happens to be the one that I can already spoil this for you, this will work. So the puzzle, um, I'm sorry, the puzzle could be a concatenation of two lists. That's a good guess. However, this part, of course, is true. The, I, I believe this. If I have a list and I have another list, and I concatenate them, no one is stealing elements. So I'm not going to prove this, as we professionals call this, a proof by hand waving. That's true, you all see that, right? But this is not really true, is it? Why, why is this not true? Can someone give me two lists for which this is not true? Depends on the value. Of yeah, but can, can you give an example for which this is not? Because I only need one example to prove it's false. Yeah, exactly. So I here have three, four, which is ascending, and I here have one, two, also ascending. But if I glue them together, the whole result won't be ascending. So this, unfortunately, is not true. However, there's something I could add to my specification that would make it true. Yeah, and it's not sorting, because that's what... <laughs> If I knew how to write sorting, I would have been at a coffee break right now. So it's not sorting. It, it's something weaker than sorting. So if I have a property for the elements of those two lists, S and T. So what has to be true for those two lists? If we think again about 3, 4, and 1, 2. If oh, the they have to be ascending. They have to be ascending. The, the, the elements, the yeah. So you can write it like this. So for any B in S and any C in T, all the Bs in the one list have to be smaller than all the Cs in the other list. If we only have that, then our problems would be solved. And again, I trust that, that you trust me that this works, but it's not that hard to prove this. So, so we're close, we only need that. <coughs> so we can write the sorting algorithm now based on the knowledge we have. This is what we already had, the empty bag and the one element bag. And we just add this. If it happens to be the case that I have one, two here and three, four there, so they're already in the right order and both of the sublists are ascending, then I may glue them together. We're done. This works, right? <laughs> no? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. My, my bear agrees. Because suppose we have a list as we have two lists that are ascending, but they're in the wrong order, three, four, and one, two. Uh, yeah, uh, what, what to do now? So of course, we are programmers and bosses of the world, so we can just make it so. We can come up with two sublists. <laughs> we can come up with two sublists, 
that have the exact property that we need. We can do that because there's no real implementation anyway, so we can just come up with things. So suppose I would have two lists, an S and a T, for which it would hold that all the Bs in the one list are smaller than all the Cs in the other list. Then I may sort them. And now, yeah, this is an actual real algorithm that you might know. Anyone recognize this algorithm? No. Quick sorts, yes. You take the list, you take a value in the middle, and then you sort those two lists. So we have derived a real algorithm from a specification. Isn't that cool? <coughs> but of course, I promised you two. So from the same specification, with slightly different rules, I'm now going to derive a second sorting algorithm that you probably also know by just changing the specification a little bit. So, again, we're at this situation, so we, we revert a little bit. We go back to the situation where we had the sorting algorithm with the puzzle, but we hadn't, have, we hadn't created the implementation for the puzzle yet. So suppose I, uh, am, I'm employed by Scrooge McDuck, and he says, recursion is expensive. I only want one recursive call. You cannot have two, you can just have the one for efficiency reasons or because you're just interesting to see, interested to see how it goes. So we cannot have two recursive calls to sort anymore. We just can have one. <coughs> so again, we have the same puzzle. Nothing has changed there. Forget about the fact that I told you that list concatenation could be a puzzle. We're back where we started. And we sort of already accidentally touched upon this a little bit, but what exactly is the type signature of the puzzle? Anyone think about that? <coughs> yeah, my fly agrees with you. It's from a pair of lists to a list. <coughs> that means that we're, if we're only going to do one recursive call, that means we cannot use the puzzle anymore because that goes from a, from a pair of lists to one list. And we, we don't have two lists anymore. We can only have the one list. So assume this S has a length of one because we cannot sort it anymore. We, we can't do anything with it. So it has to be a list of one because what else are we going to do with a list? So the sort of S plus all the sort of T <coughs> no longer works. But we have the S and we know that a list of one element, this is again from my specification I had in the beginning, a list of one element is already a sorted list. So we can get rid of the recursive call by just saying, well, a, a list of one is already sorted. We don't even need the recursion there. But we cannot do anything with this S if it's still a list. So we observe here that if we have a list of length one, Something must be in this list. So there must exist, that was that crazy E means, there must exist an element B such that S is equal to the list of just B. So I'm just going to say whatever's in that list, I will now name it B. So this is now what we have. A list of one element plus all the sort of the rest. <coughs> and what we could do, again, we're stuck help, let us just introduce a new thing called the time zone. And this type signature of the time zone is an element and a list that together make a list. And then we can define our sorting algorithm for just one recursive call by saying, if we have, I have it here, if we have one element plus the rest, we just time zone the one element into the tail. But of course, then what is the time zone, you ask? It is like the puzzle, but slightly different. Any ideas what the time zone could be? Cons. cons. Very, very, very good. What about cons? Cons seems like something that you have an element and a tail of elements, and you group them together. <coughs> First, let me bring in the simplification butterfly, because there are a few things we can do, because we now know that our B is only one length of one, and it's not a full list anymore. So all the elements of one bag is the same, because it's just one element. We, we can point right at it. And also, a bag of just one is, is ascending, a list of just one is ascending by nature, because 
it has list of one. So we can slightly simplify our specification now by removing those things we already know to be true if we're talking about elements rather than lists. So this is what we need to make true now for the cons. <coughs> Again, that first one seems legit. If we're consing an element to a list, we're not stealing anything. Nothing gets lost, so I trust it that you trust that this works. However, this, of course, yeah, it's, it's, this is not necessarily true. If, I if this is ascending and I have a B and I just glue it at the beginning of the tail, uh, that doesn't gar work guaranteed. So we could, again, make it so. We could use, make a puzzle that looks very much like the cons with only a slight change in the specification. Again, we're using induction now, so just for this case where we have an element concatenated to a list. If that list is empty, well, if the list is empty, the cons is probably a good suggestion. We can just replace the times all by a cons, because if this is the empty list, then just taking that one element with an empty tail, that is ascending. If it's just one element, that'll be fine. Seems legit. Now we have an induction hypothesis. So now we say, well, that time zone, we know it works in the zero case. We know it works if the T is the empty list. We just need to hop. So our hop is T is hat on top of tail. That's what the opposite is, or what, what this, the hop is. Initially, we had zero and a hop of plus one. Then we had an empty bag and a hop of bag union. Now we have an empty list and creating a bigger list by a hat on top of a tail. So suppose we're in this situation. How can we make that true? Well, there are two options here. Either our B is smaller or equal to our H. That is a nice, nice place to be in, because what could we do in this case? Just the cons, because B is, is already in the right place. We just put it in the beginning. However, you can see where this is going. There's, of course, also the situation where B is unfortunately bigger than the hat. So B is not really at the right place, right place yet. What do we do then? Get another B. Get another B. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's a very good. I reject this B. We can just th throw an uh, exception mesh, or or we make it a nil. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah, that's that's not it. B times all the T. Yes. Did someone say induction hypothesis? Absolutely. That T is strictly smaller than that T because this is H on top H con uh, cons T. So the tail is strictly smaller than the, the thing we started out with. So we may use a puzzle on the T. We just have to puzzle the B further in. So we can replace the T by the puzzle B. <coughs> so this is our sorting algorithm. An empty bag is the empty list. A, un a, a bag of one element is a list of one element. And if we have something that's one element plus a tail, we have a B and we puzzle it into the rest of the tail, where a puzzle is exactly what we just derived. No, that can't be right. Oh, yeah, well, that can't be right. This is the empty list, so then I take the list of B, and otherwise, we, if the B is in the right spot, we glue it to the beginning, and otherwise, we puzzle it further into the tail. Anything we could improve on this algorithm. There's something here, it is correct we could make a slight, slight modification to make it even more beautiful. Any ideas? The raccoon knows, so don't worry. <laughs> we don't necessarily need this base case anymore. We needed it in the first sorting algorithm because the way we split the list couldn't be one list with all the elements plus an empty list, because we needed to split it such a way that the lists were strictly smaller. That's not the case now. It's fine if the T is the empty list, because then you get this. So we don't need an extra base case anymore. Of course, it, it doesn't hurt, but we don't need it anymore. So that's a slight improvement we can make based upon using our mathematical brains. So this, of course, is also a sort algorithm you all, all know and love. Insertion sort. Insertion sort. Absolutely, that's insertion sort. 
So by using a mathematical specification and then a derivation, I have shown that insertion sort is actually a special case of quicksort, which is, I think is, is kind of interesting if you think about it. If you just describe them in words or even if you write them in a programming language, they look kind of different. But you see that the puzzle specification I showed you in the beginning both covers quicksort and insertion sort with different choices for the puzzle. <coughs> <coughs> so in summary, that, that's all I'm going to talk about today. So I have, a f relax, no, no more algorithms. So I have a few takeaways. One of the things is programming is math. Many people I know that like programming, they say, yeah, you know, I don't really, I don't like mathematics or I'm not good at it. And that's because if you think about mathematics, maybe you think about calculus or differential equations or algebra. Those things are also math. And, and those are all the type of math that you don't really need. But <laughs> for programming. But logic and set theory are the things that really underpin computer science and programming. So don't be too quick to say, yeah, math is useless because differential equations. Yeah, probably you don't need differential equations, but you do need practice in set theory and logic. That will, that's, that's really going to help you in programming. Of course, programming, look at this difference. I didn't say it's equal to math, I say it implies math. Of course, there's lots of other things that you need in programming, like creativity and design skills, but one of the things that's really important is to have some intuition for these type of mathematical problems. What I also think I showed you is that if you do calculation, you can learn new properties about things you're talking about. We didn't realize before what the relation between quicksort and insertion sort was. We didn't have a more generic specification. And I really don't see another way how you could get that insight than by doing structured program derivation, other than you know, some people are genius and they just see that. It's like, oh, look, that's a special case of that. But if, if you don't have that, I don't have that, then program derivation can really teach you something about what it is you're talking about. And also, this is, I think, a general strategy that's really useful in all sorts of programming. If possible, delay choices. So if you don't know what you're doing right, you just say, OK, let me introduce a function. This is the specification, and I will implement it later. I will first work on the general case, and here are some proof obligations that I still need to fulfill. Here are some things I will talk about later, but I'll first finish the general case. This really helps me. Because sometimes if you're programming, it's very tempting to start to look at very small details to try to get them right. And later you, you realize that it wasn't really all that important. So try to keep the big story in mind and delay cho choices where possible. One thing that I absolutely need to say before I close this presentation is thank you, Rob Hoogewoord. He was my teacher when I was in school at Eindhoven University, and he told me all these things and a lot more. So I just wanted to thank him for this fantastic insight because all those program derivations come from his PhD dissertation, actually. So that's it. That's everything I wanted to share. Again, this is me on Twitter. My slides are online. I'm not actually sure if there's time for questions. There's no time for <laughs> questions. I'll be around until the end of the day. Thanks. <laughs>